actually open it up to the public as well and, and see if we can, you know, draw some attention to Globe and as well as, you know, present on some really interesting material that relates to our sport and other sports. So uh, with that, I'm going to introduce um, Gavin, who is, well, I'll let him introduce himself. Introduce yourself, Gavin. <laughs> hey, my name's Gavin Schmidt. I'm Kyle's little big brother. Uh, that's how he dragged me on here for free of charge, <laughs> exploit family members. Uh, I am a ex-national team volleyball player for 13 years. I've been to the Olympics, a uh, silver medalist at Fichu Games, finished fifth in the Olympics, been to two world championships, played professionally in eight different countries for 13 seasons. Um, winning various titles in Korea, Turkey, Greece, um, and yeah, recently retired, but played high level sport for, I don't know, over a decade now. And um, yeah, now I'm here. <laughs> awesome, thanks Gavin. Um, Jen and Kyle, we're your hosts. Most of you guys know us, but if you don't know us, uh, we're both on the board of directors. Um, I'm myself, I'm the, secretary, communications, race director, all sorts of odd jobs, and as well as um, the co-chief BMX commissaire for the Saskatchewan Cycling Association. Uh, and I'll hand it over to Kyle. Yeah, and I, all you guys probably know me, I'm the president of Global BMX. And like Jan kind of alluded to, uh, we wanted to find a way that we could you know, get kids and uh, other members in the sport community some access to people that have played high level, high level sports in their life. And, what, what they've gone through to be successful and how maybe some of us uh, not so professional people can take some of those skills and transfer it down to, you know, just the grassroots portion. Um, it's, 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 it's really good that uh, we can listen to people like Gavin and some of the other series that we're going to have on the go and extract some of their, some of their wins and losses, and, you know, some of the stuff that they learned. So. Awesome. I mean, I guess with that, we'll, we're going to jump right into it. So We've got a couple sort of topics that we're going to cover today um, and we'll just, you know, we'll keep it casual, we'll have a conversation with Gavin when we, when we go through each one. And if you have questions along the way, you're more than welcome to, you can either add them to the chat or you can hit the hand button since there isn't very many of us in here today. Um, and we'll do our best to sort of answer them along the way if it's on topic. And then we'll also have a little session at the end where you can uh, ask away if you've maybe gathered up some questions along the way. So only for random facts. <laughs> only for random facts. Okay, I'll make sure to think of some as we go. Okay, so uh, with that, our sort of first topic of the night is just about that winning mental state. So we wanted to ask Gavin, um, you know, what can he share about, you know, what he's learned about his winning mental state and and how he's sort of uh, learned to try to achieve that. So. <clears throat> on this topic, the first thing I'd like to touch on is that um, men mentality in sport, much like anything, is a muscle. It needs to be trained, needs to be developed, and it needs to be learned. Um, as you're going through, you know, that, that state of mind is something that most people, they have to learn it. You know, not everybody's just born coming out with the right mental attitude to, to be a winner right away. Sometimes it takes winning a couple times here and there to, to really figure out what it takes to win and how to get there. And then it's something that you need to train day in and day out. It becomes almost part of your life. Like you live it through practice. You stay in that mindset because once you figure it out and kind of go through your path to figuring out, okay, this is what I, I personally need to do to be in a winning state. Um, you, you train it, you hone it. And you, you slowly perfect it, but it's just like growing muscles in the gym, you know, your brain, your brain and your mental capacity and, and creating those habits are, you got to work them, you got to develop them and you, it takes time and time and time. Yeah, that's a super good point. I think um, people sometimes forget, especially young kids, like you don't just go out and, and wing it. Like there's a lot that goes into those elite level athletes and, um, they're not out there just swinging it. They're putting in effort every single day, whether it's physical or mental or anything like that. So yeah, and that's and that's the big thing. The big thing is also like learning from from loss, right? That's um, had numerous coaches and numerous people across my career tell me, 
you learn so much more from a loss than you do from winning. Usually when you win, you're so, you're so fixated on, oh, I won, I did everything correct, everything went well. It's hard to go back and think of the things that went wrong, be it you know, physical, mental, where your head was at. But once, when you lose, you, know, you usually come out and you can examine externally what, what kept me from winning that race. Was it, you know, did this guy have a little bit more of a mental edge over me? Did I not focus well enough? Did I not, you know, prepare my head properly? Which is, I think, some things that we'll, we'll touch on later. Was I, you know, did I not focus? Did I, did I let up? Was I not physically prepared because I didn't take the race, you know, serious enough? Or any number of reasons, it's really easy to examine that when you lose. Um, and I think that's one of the most challenging things is for people who are winning, still developing that, that maintaining that winning mindset. Okay, I won, but what could have I done better? How could have I better prepared? How could I get my head in a better space to succeed even more? Because when you're, when you're the winner, everybody's trying to catch you. You're trying to keep that gap on everybody. And, and it's, it's constant. It's, it's just like training, training your legs, you know, riding the track, riding the track. It's, it's the same thing with your brain. You got to keep training and keep it up, up to pace and keep it in that winning mindset all the time when you're in your sport, no matter what the sport is, crisscross, BMX, volleyball, basketball, hockey, whatever be your sport. It's really, really important. That's awesome. <clears throat> Thanks, Gavin. Our next topic is just about more of the sort of tactics. So, you know, visualization before a game, during a game, you know, what do you do? What do you do to prepare and keep your mind in a good state? Um, and obviously we can, we can talk about how that applies to both your sport and, and uh, all sports. Yeah. I mean, the biggest way to train, uh, like, to get your, your, yourself in a proper mental state and to train that kind of winning mindset is visualization, you know, going through, through races, going through results, um, picturing yourself going through the race and feeling the emotions of, okay, how am I going to feel if it loses? How am I going to feel if I win? Um, going through the paces in your head, going through, through setup as, as well, using it in certain scenarios, which we can touch on after, but Overall, you know, before a race, visualizing, okay, what, what are my goals today? What, are, what do I need to work on? What's, what's, uh, what's holding me back? You know, if it's, you know, you're not collecting enough speed in a berm, visualizing that um, to understand, you know, where your weak points are, where your strong points are, and using, using that visualization to try to correct it to go through it in your head before you actually do it so you have an idea in your mind what what needs to happen it's uh it's really important for that as well as using it for you know specific skills in in racing yeah i think when we were talking earlier you talked a little bit about um video like just watching games and watching races and i think we were talking about that during this this topic like I don't think anyone ever does that enough, but I think that's a really crucial sort of piece of visualization is knowing what you look like from that, like outside in. Yeah. Like if you have access to a camera uh, where you can record races and see yourself externally, it always helps when you're, and it's, it's helped me along the way when you visualize, um, not visualizing through your own eyes as if you're right, say pertaining it to volleyball. I, I don't visualize through and seeing the game through my eyes I project myself into the situation so in racing you wouldn't you know be seeing through your helmet through your through your mask seeing your hands you would actually project yourself out of your body and watch yourself do the actions and you can better understand and link to what you need to do through that and that's that's where video comes in right you can actually see yourself doing something and that actually visualize and watch yourself in your brain doing it the way you want to or the way you should be doing it as well as you know watching the best racers we have access to you know youtube video everything now where you can you can see what the the best racers do um and and follow that and visualize yourself doing it the same way as them because it, it builds motor patterns in your head 
um, as soon as you start visualizing yourself doing that, your brain can then link your body to do it the correct way. For sure. <clears throat> That's awesome. Okay. Then also along with the, the visualization side of it is, you know, using that, like for volleyball, I, I pertained it to, you know, serving. It's the one action where it's all on me. Nobody can interfere. You know, in a race, someone can cut you in a corner or, or uh, you know, hit, hit you, take you out, take your line, um, various things which can impede your progress. Um, in volleyball, it's serving. In BMX racing, it's your start. It's your gate. It's the only thing you have complete control out of, minus your position in the gate. But from there, you know, having the visualization of, okay, what's it feel like to be in the gate? What, what, do I, what do I need to do to prepare to be in the gate? Finding yourself doing the action that you have the most control over, because the rest of sport tends to be very reactive. Someone does something and we react to that accordingly, right? So it's, it's most of sport is reactive because you're competing against someone head to head. Um, but that's one, one area where you can, you can use visualization to really excel through that because you can go through it over and over and over again and learn how to control that and what you need for, for your start, which is super important in BX. Awesome. <clears throat> Thanks, Gavin. Um, okay. So into the good stuff, what was your pregame mental routine? We know you do one, we just talked about it, but like, what was yours and you know, what do you recommend sort of athletes doing to sort of develop one? So I'll start this out just by saying that every athlete, like every person is unique. Um, every person needs to be in their own mental state to, uh, to play. For me, I needed to be very serious. I needed to get a little bit angry. That's, I learned that that's how I play best. Some guys need to be very lighthearted and relaxed and free and, and have all feelings gone. Um, with that, I had developed a routine. I knew how, what I needed, what mental state I needed to be in to win, to be successful for myself. And my routine led up to that. So I knew, okay, I don't need to be sitting in a locker room, socializing, joking with guys. My routine started all the way from hotel or home. You know, it'd be like, from an hour out, I knew what I was doing. I was having a snack, I was having coffee, I was taking a shower, I was getting dressed in, in almost the exact same way, <laughs> all the way to, to going to the gym, putting on music, not socializing, um, taping my fingers the same way, putting my shoes on in, in, in a correct order. And all those things become really valuable if you can develop it because they help get your mind set, right? It's like, I always equated it to starting a, a machine that has six different knobs that need to be turned in the correct order in order for a machine to start. Okay, I got to turn this one and then I got to pull this lever and then I got to release this valve, and then I can hit start. You're creating that series of events which can start your, your engine, your mental engine, and get you to the place that you need to be. Um, so while it's important to have one, you also need to learn how not to, if something doesn't go right, or you lose something in that routine, that it doesn't set you off. Um, and those are things that you just have to try it. You have to, you have to realize that having a good routine that fits you is really important. And then you, you try it, you try it in practice. Okay, today, you know, I, I want to get in the right headspace for practice. So Starting from home, I'm going to listen to music or I'm going to start trying to relax or I'm going to work on breathing exercises or, or whatever it may be all the way out so that when you get to practice, you can see if you're in the right headspace and then, and then, okay, that didn't work today and try it and try it into competition because that's, that's the only way to test these things, right? Is to do it for a competition day and it might not go well. You might be like, oh, dang, that really didn't work today. But you just should try changing something. Okay, what part of it didn't work? Oh, you know, I was maybe too relaxed. So I too much joking or, or I was too, too serious, too angry. I need to 
you know, stay relaxed before and then get serious a little bit closer because I'm too tired or whatever it is. It's playing with those routines um, before practice and before games and finding what gets you into the correct mental state. I also found like when I was a kid competing, you're kind of like in that you have to remind yourself that your me- your pregame mental routine is yours, like you said, but it, you also have to sort of like protect it. Like it's like a selfish time, right? Especially if you're in an individual sport, that has to be the time that you, you know, you can focus on yourself and your sort of pre-race plan. And, and it's okay to be selfish about it. Like I know when I was a young teenager, you kind of felt bad because you, you would sort of like, you know, position yourself off to the side or whatever, but you realize that like, once you start doing that, that's really what competing is all about is putting Mm -hmm. yourself first before the sort of socializing aspect, or maybe the socializing aspect is what you, how you get into the the mode. Right. I know there's people like that, but I always like to try to remind like young, young kids that it's their time. It's, it's okay. If you're in a lineup of six kids and you're silent and you're trying to focus you have to take that time for yourself, right? Yeah, that's, and that's super important. And like, you can socialize after. Yeah. Just because you're not, you know, if you're one of the people, again, you know, some people might need to socialize, but if you're one of the people, say like me, who doesn't want to socialize before, you know, you can, there's ways to be selfish about it and there are ways just to tell other guys like, hey, you know, I'm just really trying to focus right now. I'm trying to get into my, my mind space. Like, I don't, I don't like to talk before. But, you know, let's go grab a soda after or let's be buddies after the race or go grab a beer or whatever, you know, whatever level or age group you're in. You can be buddies after, but the sports don't begin at the gate drop or at the whistle or or anywhere there. It starts so much before. There's so much mental prep and and lead up to it where if you're not doing the right things, you're not going to be in the right state of mind or the right you know, if you're not going to the gym and training, you're not going to be prepared to race. If you're not doing your routine or getting your head in the right space, you're you're at a disadvantage as soon as that gate drops or as soon as that whistle blows because somebody else is doing it. Mm-hmm. They're, they're trying to get every advantage over you to win. And using that mental training, using that routine, doing everything correct for yourself, what you need, puts you in a, at an advantage of anybody who's not doing that. Yeah. And you also brought up a really good point about, you know, not completely relying on it 1000%. Like you have to be flexible with yourself and, you know, in BMX is a good, you know, a good example is, you know, you're getting in the mindset and all of a sudden someone's like, Oh dude, your tires flat or something, or you've got a, you know, something's out of place or your gear is being inspected. So out of the blue or whatever. So yeah. You made a really good point about being flexible and really making sure you can sort of roll with those, those pregame punches. Yeah, they're, they're really important to have your routine. Um, but, and, and this, and I'll preface this because this took me a long time. I used to be very dependent on my routine to get me to that state. Um, and slowly you'll learn how to not, it helps get you to where you need to go. But if one piece is missing, you know, like we would, we would play after another team and, and our start would get delayed by sometimes an hour. And I would, I would burn myself out because I'm trying to get into this headspace for too, too long, or, you know, you can exhaust yourself. Um, And slowly you learn to adapt to that. So you don't rely on it. It's just, it's an aid rather than a crutch. And it's important to have it as an aid that gets there, but don't, I'll, I'll say this now, don't expect to be perfect at it right away. Like the first time you have a routine and it kind of becomes a crutch, and something goes wrong and it kind of throws you off and you're like, oh no, like everything's wrong. And then you race bad. That's normal. That's part of, you know, developing the mental skill that you will use later on and, and get better at that as well, just as you get better at racing. Yeah. It's, I think when we were talking this morning too, we talked about, you know, how do young kids develop that pregame mental routine? Because it's not something that they can just always necessarily focus on or think about. And I, I know for uh, when I was a kid, we, we did a lot of mental training when we were like mm, 13, 14, but when yeah. you're a little bit younger, you know, taking time with your parents or your coach to sort of like, think about your routine in a practice session and maybe write down some things that you're already doing without even realizing it's part of your routine. And then you start to build on that and you might just say, okay, well, right now my routine is to show up at the track, you know, 30 minutes early and I come without my gear on, I get my gear on at the track because I really like doing it that way. And I 
have a snack right before I practice. And just writing down all those little basic things is a good way for younger kids to sort of start to develop their routine and, and build it out. And, and uh, like they, then by the time they're 13 and 14, and they're, they're maybe in a more elite sort of competition phase, they have, they have those skills and that knowledge to like, think about it without writing it down, you know? Yeah. And like, that's where parents or coaches or people come in handy, especially for, for young kids, like any parents that might be listening to this, you can start on your own, just kind of taking stock of your kid's routine, just kind of keeping an eye on them be like, okay, well, he raced really well today. Okay. Well, what, what did he do leading up to that? You know, did we, you know, did we give him a snack at this time or was he, you know, he wasn't distracted today pl off playing with his friends right before the race. Like, okay, well, maybe I need to like talk to my kid about, Hey, you know, you, you won today. You did really, really good. Maybe you shouldn't be, you know, off playing around or whatever. Maybe you, maybe you race better when you're a little more focused or you notice that he raced really well because he was off kind of relaxing and getting rid of some of those nerves and like, Hey, you know, it's, it's pregame. You don't have to tell them that you're putting them into that routine, but like, you know, Kyle's kids, Hey, Ethan, you know, um, you're, you're looking a little stressed. Why don't you go run around with Cohen or go run around with one of your buddies and blow off some steam before the race. You race really good when you do that and start helping them, like put them in the right places for that routine to build. And eventually you can, you know, kind of let them in on what you're doing. Like, Hey, you ever notice that? Like, I try to get you to do the same things for, for every race and you you're racing better and you're racing. That's how you build consistency, right? You know, Oh, you're racing really good all the time now because you're doing a lot of the same things. And there's, you know, there's ways as parents and coaches to just kind of help guide them to it by, you know, being very aware yourself. Yeah. Love it. Oh, we've got Evan joined us. Hi, Evan. <laughs> You missed it, but at the beginning, we just said, if you ever have any questions along the way, uh, just jump in and, and say hi. So I will move on to the next one here. Well, we there's one thing we should oh. touch on that, that we, we kind of spoke about this morning. Kyle brought it up, but he's like more quiet than a freaking ghost over there. I don't know. He must be nervous <laughs> on camera. Jesus. But using, using routine directly in sports. So say in the gate or something like that, directly applying it to your sport. You know, for me, when I serve, I have a, I have a routine of how I serve. I go collect the ball in the same spot. I walk back to the same point. In my head, I'm going through, through trigger words, you know, like and keeping negative trigger words. So in BMX, you know, instead of thinking like, oh, don't have a bad gait, don't have a bad start, don't, don't do this, don't do that, you flip the positive on it and you're saying, okay, what are my, what are my positive connotation trigger words that'll, that'll get me ready? So what am I trying to achieve here? If it's, if it's not having a bad start, okay, what are the positive words to do that? Which is, you know, oh, don't have a bad start. Oh, don't slip a pedal. Oh, you know, don't get a bad gate. It's okay. Get a good gate. Okay. What are my goals? I'm gonna get a good gate. I'm going to, you know, pull like pull extra hard I'm going to push extra hard with my right leg and having those so for me I had those walking back and then creating a routine as a trigger so I would bounce the ball three times spin it in my hands look at it go through my trigger words right before it and then and then go into the action and that's the same as if you watch NBA players or or anybody they have a routine for you know, free throws or for anything that's completely under their control, which is, which is what I was speaking about, about the visualization before how, you know, the gate is the only thing out of your control. So the more you can do to make sure that you're, you're in the right place for there. So you have your routine of when I come to the, when I come to the, to the, to the hill, when I come to, to, to the race, and then you have your routines in the gate as well. So all having a bunch of little subtle routines throughout are, are important, especially, especially in BMXing. I mean, your gait's really important and the better of a routine you can get in, you know, figuring out which exact height you want your pedal at. Okay. I better have my pedal at that height every time. I like to spin back three times, lock it in. Okay. Now I'm, you have those triggers, which set your body to just muscle memory it. So then you can execute it more regularly on, on over and over and over again. And you'll, you'll start to find that you'll be more regular in your gates instead of, you know, more negative. And I bet you a lot of people are doing it. They're just not recognizing they're doing it. 
And so, you know, taking stock of that and making sure that you're like, hey, I have a good routine in the gate. This is how I like to set up. This is, this is my positive thoughts. This is my, hey, what my, you know, usually we keep it around three trigger words. Hey, I want to have a good gait. I want to push hard off my right leg and I want to pull really good to, to get out. And then replicating that over and over and over again and, find, and building that routine so that you can execute it over and over again. Love it. I love how it can extend all the way to your night before too, like night before a competition. You know? Oh, frick, I, have, have a specific I, meal. Make sure you get enough sleep. When you wake up in the morning, you might have the same breakfast. You might, you know, there's yeah. all sorts of things you can sort of. I, I was probably one of the more OCD, still in day-to-day -day life, anal athletes, especially early on in my career when I was young. Because when you're young, you, you need things to help you get through. I, uh, I would never eat anything except for plain chicken and pasta and plain pasta before games on game day and i would eat the same thing the night before like it carried like and i'm not saying this is a good idea but it would carry all the way through to where when i was in korea we would play 40 or 50 games in like an eight month span and i ate plain chicken and pasta every single lunchtime before every single game and i ate the same breakfast too it was like two eggs some of some like wedges some fruits and this and like i ate i must have eaten the same meal Honestly, I did it for every game to a point where it just became such a routine that they just started making it for me at the cafeteria every day. So I ate plain chicken and spaghetti with no sauce for pretty much like an entire eight months span at once. But these are, I, I say that jokingly and it's, and it's true, but these are, I, lo I learned that from experience, right? I, you know, one time I had pasta that had, you know, the sauce was just a little too acidic and it bothered my stomach. And I went to the game with cramps. And if you have cramps when you play, like, or you race, it sucks. You got to find out what your, and you guys will go through nutrition. You got to find out what your body fuels well on. So you don't want to be crampy. You don't want to be gassy. You don't want to be eat, experimenting with things that you're eating on, on a game day. So you just find this routine of food that make you feel good. And it's what you need to, to play. <laughs> it's actually, but it, and it helps your mind too, because you're like, Hey, I'm not putting anything weird in my body where I, you know, my stomach's going to hurt for half the game or half the race. All, all very good points. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. I was going to ask why. I didn't even think about the whole like crampy, gassy thing. That makes that's, sense. That's exactly why, right? You know, if you eat some, you know, if you have, and I have a, a bit more of a sensitive stomach, you're crushing pineapple before and it's highly acidic. Like you get to the game and you, you know, stomach ache or something. Like yeah. you find out what food works for you. It's just You only eat that. Right, Kyle? Let's see if we can get him engaged. <laughs> oh, you're right. You're right. I'm just <laughs> listening to all the excellent things you have to say. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, we'll jump over to the next one. Um, yeah, basically, just looking for, you know, what are some good resources that you found along the way that, you know, athletes or parents can go to look to, um, to sort of learn more um, things about sort of mental training? So... We touched on video as far as visualization, but that's a big one. If you have access to, I mean, everybody does now, right? A camera. So say you're having bad gates and you can just get your parents or your friend up there to film it. And you can watch it. Those are great resources. Um, coaches are a big one. If you have any coaches or, or people who help you train, talking to them, uh, I, there is a book not self-promotion because I have nothing to do with the book, but this is one a book that helped me exponentially through my career, which just, it, it goes through the mental side. They, he relates it a lot to, to baseball and pitchers going through the yips and how to, how to get out of, how to get out of that and how he works with people really good. And then for me, the most important resource is your, like your competition call it your competitors or your teammates or whoever is just like talk to them just because you're racing against them doesn't mean they're an enemy you know there there's countless times where we would be in big competitions prepping before going to a world championships and and you know we'd be playing brazil who who's always a world top two and i would see my coach and their coach sitting there sharing information between each other and i would go talk to some of the other guys who play my position and be like hey how do you you know, I see you do this really well. Like, what do you, 
how do you do that? Or what do you, what do you do in training that helps you improve that? And that open flow of information between two, like it makes you a lot better and it makes your competition better, which in turn makes you better. Cause if you're competing against people who are playing really well or, or racing really well, they're going to push you to be better. And having that competition all the way through is really good. So, you know, just not being scared to go to another racer, like, Oh, you know, you, you always beat me out of the gate. Like, what do you, what do you, what do you do that, that, get, that gets you such good gates? And they, you know, they might give you 90, they might hold back a little bit. It's just like, I'll give you 90% of what I do, but I'm keeping this one for myself. But you'd be surprised at what sort of open share of information people will have just to, to, to better the sport, to better the athletes, especially here. Once you start getting to like, you know, provincial races, well, you guys, you want to represent Saskatchewan well, you want to beat all the Alberta guys. So if you're racing well provincially and helping each other get better, that's great. But even there, okay, what are you guys doing that, that gets you a better gait or you, you seem to get through, through the rhythm section a lot faster than I do. Like, how do you, are you pumping different than I am? Like, what are you doing? And oftentimes they'll share and that's, it, it really helps grow sports. It really helps people learn because everybody does things different, right? Yeah. As, as we've said, you know, everybody has their own routines. Everybody's their own athlete. That's a, that's a big part is picking up what they do different than you are and how you can implement that into your style and what you can give them and everybody can kind of get better. And, and for me, that's always been one of the best, the best tools, teammates, coaches, other racers, picking their brains, kind of sharing information back and forth. Yeah. It's, you know, when I was a kid, we, I think I was telling you this this morning, we, we had a chance to go to this topic or this talk by Mark Tewksbury. And it stuck with me like almost my whole life because, you know, he talked so positively about sport and he gave us all his tips and tricks. And it was kind of like having a, a mentor, you know, mm-hmm. and then being able to sort of find other mentors along the way. So you talked about obviously, you know, chatting with your fellow racers, like in the same age category or coaches or, mm-hmm. or whatever, but even finding an older racer who yes. you know, they might share a little bit more too. They might share that hundred percent tips with there because you're not in direct competition. So finding, finding that person that you connect with in the same sport, maybe it's a different mm-hmm. sport too. Yeah. And, and, and using that person as a mentor. I, I think that what you touched on there is really important that I, that I missed is like oftentimes, especially if you can find someone older, uh, a couple years older, you know, you're a, you're a U12 racer and you, you can't jump, you can't jump the six pack. You're not jumping that well. Well, find a mentor, find an older, an older guy who's willing to, who can do that and who can help mentor you through. Um, and, and guys the same age as you, you know, cause they, you know, they're, you go to an older guy like, Oh, how do you have better gates? Well, he's just maybe a little bit bigger, a little bit stronger so he can get out faster or he can pull his bike in a way that you can't. So utilizing all aspects older kids younger kids like you said finding a mentor um just not being afraid to to reach out to people and understanding like you know what they're probably going to help you they're probably going to want what's best and and help you get better and then everybody gets better and then sports more fun it's sports are the most fun when you're you know nobody has a great time in a race when somebody blows everybody out of the water you know the guy who wins is like yeah i won but whatever. And the other guys aren't having as much fun. The most fun games I've had is where, you know, you win, you play five sets and you win 26, 24, 25, 21. Like they're all really tight and it's really good competition. That's when sports the most, the most fun for, for people who are trying to do it at a high level. Yeah. Especially like individual sport, that kind of mentor role or finding someone to, to help you along. I mean, it's I'm sure it's a little bit different than a team sport because you have your team to sort of feed off of, yes. you know, especially an individual sport you need that someone to to keep pushing you and maybe that's your coach who yeah. the race and, and can give you those tips and maybe it's not you know we don't have a lot of coaching that goes on in our sort of grassroots club at the moment so you know I think racers really do need to rely on their their buddy or their their you know their closest competition to to get to that level yeah because especially like you said it, especially with that grassroots, you, of course, everybody, when you, when you're playing a sport or, or racing or, or, you know, whatever it is, you want to win right now. But especially as young grassroots kids, you need to, 
mentally realize like my goal is to get better when I, as I'm getting older and get to higher level competition. And if that's what you want is to, to get better and better. And like, Oh, you know, I'm, I'm 12 and he's 12. Okay. I can win right now. But like, how do we, as we get older, get to that, that higher level. And that's where, if you can kind of put your culture ego or whatever side of, okay, can I win right now? Well, how do I get to that next level of, of skill? And that's usually being open and sharing. Yeah. That's awesome. Those are all really good resources. Okay. Uh, how do you feel about, you know, mental preparedness, you know, equals success. I think we were talking about that whole wing it mentality earlier, earlier in the, the webinar. And so I'm curious to sort of see how you can chat about this one. Yeah, actually, I forgot to find that quote. But uh, honestly, it's, it's, uh, it's being prepared leads to success. Nobody, you don't see many athletes who can kind of just aloofly not train, not do it. Same as, same as mentally prepared, physically prepared. A guy who never practices comes in and still smokes everybody and wins all the time. It just doesn't, it doesn't happen. To be prepared is to be successful. Um, and winning, winning and being successful becomes a habit. So it's really important doing that, you know, in practices, doing the right things in practice, preparing to be successful there mentally and physically trying to you know build that say that competition in practice and build that competitive edge and that mental side to you so that so that when you come to the game it's it's second nature it's the same thing you do every single day it's like hey i'm not doing anything different on race day than i am in practice this race is no different than a practice because what i do every day is is leading me to be successful and it's habits create success and, and therefore winning is not it's not some some fluke it's a habit it's and that's why you see people who win are, are always kind of winning like guys who win championships cricket football tom brady lebron james you know guys who win multiple championships are always winning because it's it's a habit it's a mindset it's a lifestyle it's an everything that you come all the way through and you always you're always doing it and it's just, it's really, for me, that's the biggest thing is just always being in that mindset and being, and physically as well, you know, physically preparing to, to win and be successful, mentally preparing to win and be successful, not just sports, but in life. I mean, you want to, you want to raise at work. You, you got to live it. You got to act it. You got to, you know, mentally be ready to be successful there and, and grind at it. And it's, it's not hard. It's not, it doesn't just come we, we mentioned that earlier it's not just like oh I, yeah okay hey i'm a winner now cool i'm just gonna go be a winner sometimes it takes losing and, and developing that and and finding the things that you need in order to get to that that right level yeah agree <laughs> okay so this sort of plays on the like you know you're nervous things might be not be going your way you know, what do you do to sort of get yourself out of that or calm yourself or sort of steer yourself in the right direction? Yeah. Um, first things first, um, I find that the most useful thing is for athletes to realize that they're humans. They have emotions. They're going to be mad. They're going to be frustrated. They're going to be happy, over ha super happy. And they're going to be nervous. For me uh, personally, I've always found I've been nervous for every game I've ever played. And I've always, whether it's very nervous or a little nervous, some varying degree of nerves are always inside me. Little nerves, little excitement, little everything. That comes from, from caring, from having passion about it and wanting to do well. So it's, it's actually a good, I find it's a good thing to do well. And, and if you listen to a lot of high level athletes, they all say, I always have nerves because you know, you're either it's about, I'm nervous because I want to, I want my best performance or I want to win or something's on the line, but there's always some emotions and, and nerves there. And, and the most important part to that is just recognizing that that's a human emotion and that's okay. Yeah, okay you, to be nervous. What'd you say this morning? Nerves, nerves are normal. And I like that because it kind of rolls nerves off are, the tongue. Nerves, yeah, are, nerves normal. are normal. Yeah. Nerves are normal and they're, they're good. It's just like being sad is normal. Sometimes you're sad. It's okay. It's normal. Not every day is perfect and great. Nerves are normal. And so understanding that and being like, and not letting, it's not the nerves that affect your performance. It's overreaction to the nerves. 
so going into going into your race I'll, I'll use that or going into to a game for me being like oh i'm nervous oh god and then overthinking that and being like oh god like oh i gotta do well or oh i'm so nervous what's what's gonna happen so they're just being like okay oh what am i feeling oh i'm nervous okay so we used uh before the olympics we used a well here's the card and it's written on here and it's uh the keys recognize accept reconnect so it's it's recognizing what you're feeling and this works in competition as well as before for nerves for everything so pre-game i'm feeling nervous oh god what am i what's going on i'm not feeling so good or i'm jittery or whatever oh i'm nervous okay step one recognizing okay i'm nervous second acceptance of that okay yeah i'm nervous okay that's okay that's a human emotion that's fine i'm allowed to be nervous that's okay that's not a problem okay recognize accept okay now the third is the key reconnect to what you need to do to be successful okay oh i'm nervous yeah i'm nervous that's nervous that's okay good okay what do i got to do to win what do i got to do to perform what do I, where do i got to get my mind back to that's and that's okay and that'll that'll help wash those nerves away because all of a sudden they're not a big a big uh you know heavy backpack on your back anymore like oh god i gotta drag these nerves with me it's just like oh okay yeah i was nervous okay that's good nerves are normal good i'm allowed to have them okay what do i gotta do okay i gotta have a good gait i gotta have good corners i gotta have that back into your race mode and, and right back into your mental training into your rhythm and your routine and all these things we've talked about thus far and then and then you can still be successful even with them and and you actually learn to to have them because the times when you don't have them you're like oh why am i not nervous and then kind of you're like oh yeah they're there okay i am a little okay good there we go now i'm a, now i'm alert <laughs> I love it. I love it. Cause that is a sort of mantra that can apply to all ages, you know, especially I think of that sort of, you know, seven, eight year old, nine year old racer, and they're just bouncing off the walls and some might be really nervous not saying anything. And I, I hope to be able to use that term this, this summer, because I've never, I've never really thought of it that way. Like nerves are normal. And then that like recognize, accept, reconnect. That is such a good, simple statement that that can apply to anyone in sport. So I love yeah. it. It's, it's really, it's really important. And then using that to further using that, like recognize, accept, reconnect, it can happen in a race. I think Kyle, you were talking about it this morning. You know, what if you, what if you wipe out getting up? Okay. I'm mad or, or whatever. I don't want to race anymore, especially for young kids. You know, you you, you wipe out, you're really, you have a lot of emotions. You don't know how to deal with them yet. <laughs> you're not an expert on your emotions. So you wipe out and you're so angry and you come off and, and you, okay, you get on your bike and pump it all angry and you get off and you're, I don't want to race anymore. I'm all mad. Okay. Well, what's the matter? Well, I'm, I'm mad. Why? Because I wiped out. Now I can't win. Okay. Well, it's okay to be mad. I accept that. That's all right. You're okay to be mad, but you have two more races left to do. So what are you going to do? Are you just going to stay here and be mad and dwell on the past or are you going to move on and recognize it, accept it and reconnect to what you have to do okay you got two more races if you do well in those you know you can still make it to a main or you can still make it farther and farther or, or you could maybe instead of finishing last because you're all mad and filled up with emotions and not focused on what you need to do you might finish last the next two races and be the last place racer or you go out and you reconnect and you race two more good races and you finish first and second and you all of a sudden you have a medal yeah totally I think it's, you know, especially if kids, that's the whole part about that, practicing that kind of stuff over and over again is, you know, if you're in the middle of a race and you, you've been passed and all of a sudden that sort of like throws you, it's yeah. like, you know, what do you go back to? Well, if you haven't been sort of practicing those sort of mental sort of tactics and tips and whatever, you might not have anything to fall back on and, and it will yeah. sort of cost you that race. But the more you sort of learn and grow and, you know, it's just like in a ski race, you have a slip up. It's like, well, you got to just keep going. It might've felt like a complete explosion or a bomb went off in your mind. But if you can just remind yourself to like, keep pushing and keep going, those are the things that start to get you through those really tough times in sport. They are. And, and you know, the more you do them, the faster you'll get through them. The first time it might take a while to, Oh, what's, what's going on? Oh, frick. Oh, I'm mad. Okay. Well, it's okay. I'm mad. Okay. Now I go back to it. But after you do it a few times and you practice it, like, again, the brain is a muscle. You'll, you'll get past and be like, oh, I'm mad. Oh, it's okay to be mad. Okay, I got to keep racing. Let's go. 
and you're right back into it and, and you'll have those cues and they'll get you through exactly like you said it's really it's really important to not and it and that'll that'll come with like not not quitting it'll help you continue to 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 push through especially when you're you know unmotivated or a little bit down totally this is our last one of the night and then we'll open it up for some q a if anyone has any but um yeah just like advice to and i i hope you remember what you touched on this morning because it's really important but advice to others when they're trying to achieve that sort of high level or their or athletic goals like what's your best piece of advice or multiple pieces of advice the, the, you wanted the really corny <laughs> analogy from this morning that's the piece of advice that you're looking for <laughs> Thanks. No, I'll let you, I'll let you go and then I'll fill you with <laughs> all your own advice. <laughs> Honestly, I, I think the first thing is just um, never limit yourself. Never go into something limit, limiting yourself because of any preconceived notion that you might have. Oh, I'm not, I'm not big enough. I'm not tall enough. I'm not fast enough. I'm not strong enough. I haven't been doing it long enough. I'm not as good as the other guys yet. I'm not this. I'm not that. You have to go into it accepting that you, everybody has the possibility to make it to the highest level. I didn't start volleyball till I was 18. I started really, really late. And most people hate me for it because I managed to pick it up really fast and get really, really far in my sport when most people have been doing it six years later. But one thing about that was I, you know, a lot of times when you start things really young, I mean, you, you, you have more experience than other people. So your skill base might be a little farther ahead. We also develop some bad habits. And so if you're someone who's maybe looking at starting into sport a little bit younger, that doesn't mean you're not going to make it really far. You might be, you know, a little less skilled at the time when you're starting than someone else, but you might also have less bad habits. So you can always play catch up and you're always trying to catch up and you're always trying to get there. So it's just my biggest thing is just don't limit yourself. Don't, don't put a cap on what you think is possible. I never thought I would play professional sport. I never, like, my goal is like, oh, I'll play volleyball and maybe I'll go to university and then it'll be over. Like, and that's what I was thinking. And I was capping myself. Luckily, I managed to get out of that right away because I got some exposure and, you know, some people kind of talked me out of that mindset. But that's, that's the biggest thing is like, never cap yourself. Um, don't, don't think you can't do something because of some preconceived notion that you have of yourself. Um, is the biggest thing to, to getting to that high level and to that and, and to getting to the top and giving yourself the possibility to get there and also understanding that you might never get there. You know, we kind of touched on it this morning, um, talking about how bad of a golfer Kyle is and him just <laughs> accepting that. But it's it's also understanding what you want out of the sport. Yeah. You know, is this is this a hobby? Okay, that's and that's fine. You don't have to. You don't have to want to go pro. You don't have to want to make it to the national team. You don't want to have to go to the Olympics. Not everybody wants that. Some people just want to, you know, go to work and come race at night and have fun and, you know, compete and get a little bit of competition in their life. And that's, that's fine. That's, we were talking about it for golf. Um, my buddy told me right away because I'm, I'm, I get frustrated really easy. You know, as a professional athlete, well, why am I not perfect at golf? And I get all grumpy and I would be all crusty through a round and, but he's like, dude, you need to figure out what you want from this. He's like, do you want to, you know, be a scratch golfer, come out here and every single day be very, very serious about it and do that? He's like, or do you just want to come out and have a couple of beers with buddies and get away from the house and have a good time? And I was like, oh, well, I think I kind of like both, but now I'm a lot less stressed out when I'm having that round because I'm not going to, I'm not trying to go to the PGA. No, I don't care. I kind of just want to be good enough that I don't embarrass myself when I go with new people. That's, you know. And having and understanding that and, and again, accepting, recognizing it and accepting that that's fine. You know, maybe you don't have these big, huge lofty goals for BMXing. Maybe it's just something that, you know what, I just kind of, I want to do it because I like to do it. And that's, that's enough. That's, that's fine. Like that's very okay. It really, it really does apply to like all things that you do. Like I, we were talking this morning about golf, golf, same for me. I just thought I should be good. I didn't start playing until I was in grade 12 thought I should just be good. I have a family full of golfers. Then I realized that, no, that's not, that's not what I am in golf. I just need to sort of like take the pressure off and decide that I just want to come out for fun. Same thing with running. We were talking about running. Like yeah. my goal isn't to run a 50 K or a marathon. I just want to be fit. So I want to go out and I'll run 
whatever I want to run in a day to, to feel good. And, and taking that pressure off is a really, really enlightening piece of advice because, you know, same thing with BMX. I think, I think a lot of sports, you know, especially team sports, like hockey, we'll use as an example. And, mm -hmm. and maybe it's true for hockey and maybe it's true for some sports, especially if you want to go a certain direction, but you know, you don't, maybe you don't have to be playing five days a week when you're seven years old. And yeah. for BMX, you don't, you don't, you can come into it when you're 16 or 17 and no, you might not make the national team, but you can compete at world championships. You can compete at a national level just in a different way. And so it opens up that door of all of a sudden, like that's a different kind of fun you can have with those sports is just like you said, not capping yourself. Yeah. And, and one thing I didn't, I mean, we didn't talk about it this morning is also like, don't don't put over pressure on yourself to get to, if case say you are an athlete who wants to make a national team or make it to an olympics or whatever it may be don't sit there all day putting pressure on yourself to do that that'll it'll either happen or it won't you can't you can't focus on the things you can control which is your day-to-day -day, your training your your races your whatever and and if you focus on that you might make it you might not not a lot of people do honestly it's very hard to, to make it to the Olympics. It's very hard to be one of those few athletes that do it. And that's not to say you can't do it, but to sit there and fixate on it and, and get, get depressed and get down on yourself. It's like, oh, now I'm never going to make it there. I'm never going to be able to do that. Well, don't worry about that right now. Wor worry on the small, the small goals that lead there. Okay, I want to, you know what? I want to place in provincials now. And then I want to, and I want to move up and I want to, my end goal is to make it to the national team, but I'm not going to put pressure on that. I'm not going to worry about that right now. I'm not going to let that stress me out. I have other little things I need to achieve. Okay. I need to achieve having a better gait. I want to win one race this year, or I want to win two races, or I want to be first in the province and get a chance to go to nationals or whatever. Maybe small goals along the way that are actually attainable will lead you to where you need to go and it'll happen or it won't because you know, sometimes you might be at your very, very, very best. There might just be someone who's a little bit better than you. And it, and it sucks, but that's a reality of sport. And sometimes you have to accept that, be like, but I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm the best I can be. And it's like, I know, and I'm sorry, but there is someone who just is a little bit better. And that's, and that's life and that's sports. It's the same as racing, you know? You can have a perfect race and someone can have just a little bit better of a race and still beat you. And that's the world. And you can't put pressure on yourself for that. Like, well, how do I can... How can I be more perfect or more better or, or more get there? It's just focus on the little things and let that path lead you to where you're going to end up. And if you do it like that, you're giving yourself the best chance to get there. And I think that's the most important thing for people to realize when trying to get to, you know, if, if where you want to go is an elite level is let your path get you there. Do the small things right. Do the day-to-day -day things right. And your path will either lead you there or it won't. I, yeah, I love it. I've loved all the advice. I wish I was back in sport again. <laughs> you are, you're running and you're golfing. Yeah. Just doing it in a different light, which is okay. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I'm going to uh, ask the crowd here. I mean, thanks Gavin for all that perspective. I think it's, you know, it's, it's nice to hear from someone like, like you said, that jumped into the sport super late and still sort of had this like really crazy successful career. And I think that even though it's sort of a, a abnormality, it's uh it, it, it's inspiring. And I think it, it'll, it'll, um, you know, it's good to share that message with other kids. Thanks for giving me a platform. Yeah. I'm going to ask if anyone has any, has any questions. I mean, we covered a lot, but if anyone has any, you know, if they're a parent or a coach or they want to ask Gavin anything about his career, you know, fire away. I don't see any, any mics coming off. So Nobody wants to know why my older brother is a subpar athlete. <laughs> the dud of the family. I'll, I'll see you on the track, buddy. I'll see you on the track. All right. I suggested this morning they do a they do a one v one BMX lap, then run over to the the soccer field and do a one v one serve off or something. I don't know. I don't know that it's like. What if I did beat him? I haven't ridden a BMX in I don't know twenty years now. If I went out and I beat him, and this is something, would he, he would have to step down as president of the club, right? Pretty much. Be, at the club anymore. 
it'd be all in your lap at that point. But. I have a good feeling like you wouldn't though. <laughs> you got to give him some credit. <laughs> I, would need, I would need at least a couple of weeks of training. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I guess uh, I'll give it one more little round. If anyone has any questions, you know, feel free to, to ask yeah. away. Anything at all. I'm pretty open book, honestly. And if you don't, that's okay too. So basically just for everyone on the call, we're going to, we've recorded this and we are going to um, post it on our YouTube channel so that we can share it out with everyone. So, and I guess with that, we'll say thanks to Gavin. Thanks for joining us tonight. And uh, yeah, we're going to uh, be hosting his wife next week for nutrition, a nutrition session. And maybe, maybe he'll make an appearance in the background. You can check in. Yeah, maybe. Has I believe that one. From this week. <laughs> I always get humiliated. I'm not even the best. I like, I, Talk about beating Calder race. I'm not even the best athlete in my house. Jeez. <laughs> a lot of holes. Nobody lets me, nobody lets me live down there. She's been to Mar and picks on me. Jeez. No, no, we won't. I won't do it tonight either. <laughs> no, nobody will. It's okay. It's awesome. It's my burden. It's my burden that I have to live with for, for starting that. Awesome. Well, thanks so much again, Gavin. And yeah, thanks for everyone for joining us. And um, yeah, we'll see you next Saturday. Yeah, thanks, have a good guys. night, everyone. Nice Appreciate it. My pleasure. Bye, guys. Bye.